Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Politics Matters podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Jakubowski, and today we'll be previewing the 2022 gubernatorial elections, just one month out, with my good friend Arthur Garden. Again, that's at Garden Arthur on Twitter if you want to drop him the follow. But yeah, Arthur, a pleasure to have you here. How's your day been going? Thanks for having me on, Ryan. It's been good. How's yours? Um, I've been pretty good too. I've uh, been, you know, pretty productive today, which is what I and would have liked to have done. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about a few governor's races. We have a core six we've established that we think have like realistic chances of going to either party. And then we also have just a brief, uh, you know, at the end, we'll do a brief uh, final tally here for my predictions and Arthur's predictions. But before that, I do want to, I'm actually going to put you on the spot here. I didn't tell you this, but I'm going to put you on the spot here. So last week, after we got that string of very curious Oklahoma and South Dakota polls, you tweeted, quote, roast me all you want, but I think South Dakota and Oklahoma governor flipped before Georgia, which I'm assuming you meant governor. So, yes. yeah. Okay, thank God. Because if if not, I, I would be really confused. So, um, that's an interesting take. I don't think it's like a month ago it would have been delusional, but now it seems like you, you know, got a, at least a bit of evidence to back that up. So, what makes you think that, you know, a state states as red as South Dakota and Oklahoma are – in a position which they would flip before a state like Georgia, which actually voted for Joe Biden in 2020? Well, I think that we've got to sort of break Georgia up and isolate it as its own matter. And then I, I think Oklahoma and South Dakota are sort of quite interlinked um, in this respect. And I think that Georgia, we, we, despite running Stacey Abrams, who did respectably well last time and, and is fundraising a lot, she's not particularly running a strong ga- uh, ground campaign. Brian Kemp's approval ratings are fairly solid for a, for a swing state incumbent. Um, of course, this is a, a midterm year. Usually the, the party in power has a bit of a kickback. I, I just think that all signs point towards, because of Kemp's popularity, uh, a likely R race. And I think that he clears 50 in round one. Now to break off um, Oklahoma, uh, I think that Joy Hoffmeister might be the best Dem recruit in the entire country. Um, despite being a former Republican, I think that she, she's doing really well with the native tribes. She's today been endorsed by all five. Um, and of course, Stitt's approvals, despite I think the recent morning cold salt pot had him above water, but they're, they're not nearly even as solid as Brian Kemp's. Um, his education moves of angered many in the rural areas and I think that Hofmeister is a good candidate for Oklahoma so I'd say um, likely are so despite me having both as likely I think if I had to pick which one would be closer to flip I'd say Oklahoma at the moment just because of momentum and the other factors and sort of a similar thing with South Dakota Jamie Smith a great recruit for Democrats of course Christy Noem famously not having great approval ratings there um and it's a state where Democrats have seemed to always do better down ballot, where the reverse seems to be true for Georgia. So, yeah, I, I don't think either or any of the three have much chance of flipping, but that that's my hot take and make of it what you will. So what do you think? So I'm assuming you think the like, actually, I'll just ask you, if I made you guess, what would the margins for South Dakota, Oklahoma and Georgia be? Just rapid fire. I'd say probably Kemp crossing 50, maybe sort of plus seven, plus eight, maybe. I think Hofmeister by, loses by six to Stitt. And I think Noam probably beats Smith by a similar margin. So that's interesting. Um, I was going to say, so actually, you did not do what I expected. So I thought you were going to say something like, so I think in terms of median outcomes, Stitt and uh gnome win by a little more than Kemp, but I think there's more volatility in those states. So that's what I thought your argument would be. But that's interesting. You outright actually think Abrams is just going to lose by more than uh, Jamie Smith and Joy Hoffmeister. So um, I'm still a very, like, I, I, I'm i still on the safe R train for both South Dakota and Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma goes to Kevin Stitt by like 18. I think South Dakota goes by a similar amount. You know, I, I think they're going to vote in line with each other. My only... I haven't, you know, I'm I'm modeling county maps. I've I began doing that uh, yesterday, and I've you know done some states. I haven't uh, done Oklahoma yet, but my assumption is that you think obviously Hoffmeister is going to win Oklahoma County. She'll probably win 
Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the county below it, but it's the Trump plus 15 county. That probably flips too. Do you think she's going to do better? Like, and obviously, basically everyone in Oklahoma is going to trend blue. But do you think she's going to do better in the relative to Biden in the suburbs, in the city of Oklahoma City, or in those rural areas that, like you said, have been so disaffected by the state administration? Um, oh, I think probably the swings will be better in the rurals, but of course the the margins she'll do better in uh, obviously in areas like Norman, Tulsa, and Oklahoma City. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I would, I think that's probably the best assumption. I gonna so I'm actually gonna uh, say that South Dakota, this so like I think in Oklahoma we're gonna see like a, a a swing towards Democrats everywhere, and I think especially in the rural areas because those are bluer down ballot, and because that's like states worst constituency i think south dakota knows that she'll do like all right in the suburbs she'll still underperform trump but like i think she does all right i think she just gets smoked in the rural areas for a republican do you uh, do you agree with that yeah i'd agree i think actually she'd probably be still underperforming the urban and suburban areas but yeah i i could see the rurals again sort of lashing quite hard against no one yeah i think that's reasonable um so i have so it's interesting. You have all those races likely are. I have Oklahoma and South Dakota as safer. I still have Georgia as leaner, although I think it's certainly closer likely than toss up. My only my only reservation about Kemp is that like the only reason I still have it as lean is that the runoff exists. And Shane Hazel is like a total thorn in the sides of the GOP and he's running this year and he's actually like trying to like get votes. And so I think um Kemp would be like, yes, Kemp kind of traded off a lot. Because like with his election stuff, you know, he said he, he kind of stood up to Trump in a way. And I think that helped him with voters in the Atlanta suburbs. But I do think there's going to be like a non-zero amount. Again, this doesn't mean much, but like I think there's going to be like a non-zero amount of voters uh, in areas that were more strong. Again, Purdue did terribly in that primary, but like you still have areas where he did better than other areas. And I think that when you take a look at the counties in the you know north and in the rural south where Purdue did best, I think uh, Shane Hazel is going to do decently well there. And there's like a high enough chance of that happening to where you got like a 49 to 46 type situation on the lower end of outcomes for Kemp that gets you to do a runoff, which I think would be narrowly leaning towards Kemp, but would still put Abrams way back in the, you know, in play. Yeah, I, I could see that. I could see Shane Hazel making yeah better in Rose in, in the rurals, but I, I still think Kemp crosses 50, um, uh, which is why I have it as like, yeah, I think if it was to go to a runoff, I'd have it as, as lean, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that's I agree. A, I think it's I think it's a fair tag. Yeah, that's I I mean I, I can see that. Again, I'm just pretty high on the Georgia Democrats in general. I think Abrams is like getting like yes, yeah, her campaign this year has been underwhelming from what we expected maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago. But I still think she has like like I like I've heard people saying she's five percent chance, I think it's with like fifteen or twenty. Um so yeah. Now the big six races we're gonna be talking about here are the states of Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, Kansas, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And so I think out of those thick six, to me, there's an obvious outlier, which is Pennsylvania, because um, I've moved it to likely D yet, just because I'm not as confident as I'd like to be when I do make that move, which is probable in the next few weeks. But it's pretty close, and I think you have this likely D. So um, I just want to talk about Pennsylvania because I think – because first of all, like this race is like really funny to me in that a bunch of people just cannot accept reality. Like this race is just – broke everyone's brains especially on again not all republicans but i think there are a lot of republicans who still for some reason that i will never understand still think mastriano was like in a favored and like you know they've been obsessed with mastriano for a while now because you know he's in the eyes of them one of their better candidates but like i genuinely don't see it and i literally i i've tried to understand it i've, I've tried to like think you know i've tried to put myself in the shoes of someone who thinks doug mastriano is going to win and all i get is just like what so um, what do you think we're going to see in Pennsylvania, and what do you think the odds of uh, Doug Vember coming to fruition actually are? Because I don't think they're really high, and I think anyone who like thinks they're particularly high is just kind of, you know, doing the wish casting stuff. I'd say maybe fifteen percent maximum um, chance. I, I think that Shapiro probably wins by high single digits at the moment. The RGA seems to have effectively triaged Pennsylvania. Mastriano's ground games week i don't even think that he's got advertisements yet and if he does it's not particularly many you're seeing um newspapers and, and republican politicians cross su support and, and endorse shapiro it, it has all of the makings of a likely R race and i think that shapiro is a strong enough candidate and that mastriano is a weak enough candidate that despite 
the Senate race probably being fairly close that this race won't um won't track with that and it, yeah as I said maybe Shapiro plus seven or eight I have it at Shapiro plus five and a half um do you think just rapid fire do you think he wins um Lancaster no I, I think that Lancaster is probably a bit too red I think if he wins by high singles maybe 11 12 it could possibly go but I think it's just too red for a single digit victory to to carry it that's fair and it's also, I think, in closer proximity where Mastriano's from, so maybe he'll be like, I think all of Pennsylvania swings hard against Mastriano, but I think he'll respect, you know, relatively do best in, you know, Pennsylvania, as they call it. So that's that's Pennsylvania. I again, Arthur thinks uh, you have it going by eight. I have it going to Shapiro by you know just under six. Basically, like me to me at this point, I think lean is still my rating just because I do want because like we haven't got polls in like two weeks and it's just really weird. So I do want to see more polls out of Pennsylvania. That being said, I'm pretty confident at this point that Shapiro is going to be fine. Um, so the next state is Wisconsin, which is a state that I've been pretty. So I actually got called out um on Twitter because I, and, and I'm not going to spoil the rest of the tweet because it does correlate to what we're saying, but um. I so I got called out by a lot of people for saying that Tony Evers was pretty cooked yesterday, or I think two days ago was it, on Twitter, and my logic was basically that yes he's an incumbent he still has a chance in theory but when I look at a map of Wisconsin I, and like you t like tell me make a pass for Tony Evers to win it gets really hard for me really quickly so I want to hear what your because I actually don't know what you think about Wisconsin so uh do you think it's still in toss up territory and if so who do you think wins or do you have a strong take. No, I'd probably say tilt. Ah, uh, um, unfortunately, Eva's approvals aren't particularly great. He's being outraised. It doesn't look like Wisconsin's particularly going to be great. Uh, all things considered, for Wisconsin this year, the Wisconsin GOP seems to have a strong um, operation on the ground. I, uh, I think it's still close. And I think Eva's got a much better chance than Barnes does. Um, but yeah, I, obviously, Wisconsin polling usually underestimates Republicans. And while I don't think it'll underestimate Republicans as much as it, it has done in the past, particularly in 2016 and in uh, 2020, I think that uh, either probably goes down by one or two. I think it's closer to three or four. Do you think he's going to do, do you think he outruns Biden in the old Wisconsin or in the new Wisconsin three, which is Trump plus five? Uh, I'm not sure if he'll actually outrun Biden, but I think he'll outrun his 2018 numbers, um, which I believe were a lot weaker than than, um, than Biden's in areas. Wait, what in, should I probably say? Sorry, sorry, I I, I said Wisconsin three, like like the the driftless seat, the working class uh, kind drift, of seat. Uh, yeah, I sorry, sorry, my mistake. I got caught up with a wow. Uh, no, I think he'll probably underperform Biden. No, underperform his twenty eighteen numbers, but overperform Biden slightly in the um in the driftless area and then vice versa in um wow. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was gonna say it would be really like Evers would actually win if he outperformed Biden and wow, that would be pretty unexpected. Um do you, okay, and then my last Wisconsin question for you is what do you think the delta between Evers and Barnes is? Because I have I have both them losing. I have Barnes losing by al almost five and I have Evers losing by three. So I think it's about a one and a half, two point delta between them. And I think that uh, Barnes is going to do especially poorly relative to Evers and WOW, because I think Johnson's a better candidate than Michels or than Michaels is for the region and vice versa for Barnes and Evers. But I do think they're going to run fairly even with the rest of the state, but there's going to be a disparity in, you know, Waukesha and Ozaki and whatnot. Yeah, I'd say probably about a point at the moment. If you ask me how much Barnes goes down by, I'd say, yeah, maybe maybe three, maybe three and a half. So, yeah, I'd say a similar delta, maybe slightly less, but I don't think that it will be the, the best year of um, that Wisconsin Dems have had recently. Um, I'm not sure if they get completely swept statewide, but I think the third been triaged by Dems, that one's flipping. Um, I think that the Senate race will hold and then, yeah, Governor will flip. So, Depends on those down ballot races, but yeah, on on the whole, I don't think Wisconsin will be the best year for the Democrats. Probably. Yeah, well, I, be the best it, state. Yeah, Wisconsin's looking really rough for the because like Democrats have actually had like 
you know, just to step back and look at this for a second, they're outperforming in Minnesota. They're doing insanely well in Michigan. Fetterman's in a, like, Fetterman might not, like, I think Fetterman's favored for the record, but, like, you know, there's still, like, I think a 35, 40% chance he loses. Um, right, but, like, Fetterman's in a better spot than I think anyone would have expected him to be in back in May or June. Uh, and, you know, Tim Ryan's putting up a fight in Ohio, which is not something I expected. Obviously, I think we knew he was a good candidate from day one, but, you know, he's putting up a fight, I guess. And, I mean, that's really it. But, like, I think Wisconsin's, like, the, you know, really the sore thumb of the, you know, those Midwestern states for Democrats because, like, Barnes's momentum lasted pretty, you know, it, it didn't last particularly long. Looking like Wisconsin 3 is basically a done deal at this point. Brad Bass is basically getting abandoned by national Democrats, as you said. And in addition to that, I'm pretty bearish on, you know, I'm pretty bearish on Tony Evers. So I don't think Wisconsin, I, I think Wisconsin is going to be a red sweep this year, which obviously for me as a Democrat is pretty disappointing. I think it's disappointing for you as well, but it's just what I'm looking at right now. And also for the record, just, you know, because I know there's still people, I know people who think Tony Evers is still favored. Um, if the polls undershoot Evers by as much as they undershot or uh, undershoot Michaels by as much as they undershot Trump by in 2020, Evers would lose by seven. I don't think he'll lose by seven. I think it's closer to, like I said, three or four. But yeah, uh, not looking too good for Tony Evers, even though I, th I think he's an underrated governor, but, you know, uh, unfortunate. So speaking of underrated governors, Kansas, this is a state that I think we disagree with, uh, disagree on the most. I'm going to let you take it first because I know you have Kansas takes and I want to, I, I, I want you to lay this out. Yeah, I do have Kansas takes. So I, I think you have Laura Kelly losing, right? I have her losing by five. And by the way, I, I, I just want to say, I, I just want to say, uh, Arthur was, I, I, I think, beat me in our last podcast where we talked about Kansas briefly. And but that was, I was super numerous to go and Kelly back then. I had her losing by like nine, I think. And, you know, you were, you were like, no, it's even closer than you think. And I was kind of like, no, it's not. But so I think round one goes to you, although round two is more important. But yeah, do, do lay her Kelly takes, please. I think at the moment, it's probably tilt, one, uh, tilt D. I think she probably wins by around one. Um, obviously, I'm I'm not saying that the abortion referendum will track, uh, particularly closely with with the gubernatorial results. Otherwise, we'd be talking about a Kelly landslide. But her approvals again, which is important for states like Kansas, I think, are strong. The Kansas economy seems to be fairly strong. Um, Schmidt, while I think is a good get for for Republicans, his campaign's not been um, amazing. Uh, it's a state where lots of college educated Democrats who will, will turn out and have turned out the registration numbers again look particularly promising for Kansas. The you know, the base seems energized. And I think in areas like Wichita and in Topeka, she'll get enough crossover to win a second term. So obviously I think we're gonna have a bit of a back and forth on this one because it, it's more fun that way. But um my counterpoint to that is that I think it's it's all about electorate turnout. And what I mean by that is when you look at the abortion referendum, yes, that was a very good result. It was a better result than anyone could have expected for the pro, uh, pro-choice side. Obviously, bodes very well for Laura Kelly and, you know, Therese Davids and whatnot. By the way, I do think Davids is going to win, so I'm not a total Kansas doomer. But um, my, like my thing with Kelly is that I think that her her overperformance in 2018 – was good, but I don't think it's good enough to like translate to a 2022 victory. And it doesn't directly correlate with the 2018 result or with the 2022 run, uh, uh, referendum results. And what I mean by that is if you look at the 2022 referendum, there was basically like not fully uniform, but like the, the pro-choice side won every congressional district in the state. And they did especially well in, in David's district. And, you know, that seat went six, it went two to one in favor of, uh, you know, essentially keeping abortion legal in Kansas. And so, um, Kelly's over, Kelly's biggest overperformances in 2018 uh, didn't direct. They they came from Wichita and in, in the rural Roger Marshall part of the state, and so I think Kelly's getting really overstated in rural areas because like a lot of the hype for her comes from oh well Sam Brownback is unpopular and you know she's been tying Schmidt to Brownback which like yes is a good strategy, but my issue with that take is that a lot of those voters who voted for Kelly in 2018 didn't vote for Kelly because Kovac was too extreme because like. People say, oh, Kovac was uniquely terrible. Like, yes, he was. And that's why he got demolished in the suburbs. But the thing is, I don't think that it was Kovac that, you know, cost the Republican rural Kansas in 2018. What cost them rural Kansas in 2018 was that Sam Brownback closed rural hospitals and he was just a terrible governor for the state. And so 
that's why rural voters were just like, screw it, I'm going to vote for the Democrat in this governor's race because, you know, Kelly ran a good campaigning because, uh, you know, it was just a generally a good year for Democrats. Now that they don't have that wind at their back, now that, you know, Kelly's been in office for four years and yes, Brownback is still a memory, but he's not as, you know, ripe as ripe of memory as he was in 2018. I think Kelly's going to massively underperform what like, what's expected of her in rural areas. I think she'll hold her own in the suburbs. I think she'll do pretty well in Kansas City, but I don't think she's going to be able to hold up in the rural areas. And that's why I'm just really concerned about her right now. Hmm, I, I'm probably yeah going to I'll, I'll agree with you on on the rural part. I don't think that her rural performances will be um, comparative to statewide as impressive as 2018. But I think she makes up for that in, in counties like Shawnee and in in uh, Wichita, which is Sedgwick County. Um, but I, again, I think that if you look, Kansas's economy strong. They they've got, I think their their rural healthcare has been a focus of Kelly's campaign. So in that respect, I don't think that she'll do as poorly as as some people think, yourself included. And I I would risk judging her performance off of her twenty eighteen performance because by then the same argument could be made that somebody like Ned Lamont, who's in a direct rematch with Stefanowski, would be in trouble, and it looks like he'll win by a likely margin. Obviously, not apples to apples, but it's why I'm a bit hesitant to say that only because she won by six in in a much bluer year that that she's in trouble this time. I mean, yeah, but like, in in, in fairness, for, uh, in to defend my comparison, um, the reason that it doesn't work for Lamont but works for Kelly is because Lamont in 2018 was a non-incumbent and it was an unpopular democrat that really screwed him over that made the race close uh dan dan malloy and you know it was kind of kelly in 2018 that came off an unpopular republican so i think that that circumstance made it you know in kansas made it bad for the republicans and connecticut made it bad for the democrats but i think now that it's flipped which is why you know republicans in connecticut are going to do a lot worse than they did in 2018 and democrats in kansas are going to do a lot worse than they did in 2018 so that that's my comparison uh, my mm -hmm. question for you is do you think Kelly carries Sed Sedgwick, and, and I'm asking this not because I think it's you know interesting or anything, but I, well, I mean it is interesting. But my my point here is that I so I modeled Kansas today because it was you know one of the races I thought I'd do, and I had Kelly losing Sed uh, Sedgwick by half a point, and so I'm assuming you're going to have her winning it because you have her doing five points better statewide than I do. Yes, and I, I alluded to it previously. I think counties like Sedgwick will be um, areas where comparative to Biden and comparative to her previous result where she'll, she'll be particularly strong this year. I do have her winning it maybe by six or so, seven maybe. I, I'm quite six. bullish on her there. Yeah, no, I I mean, I I could see it. Um, It was it was pretty strong dur uh, for, for the pro-choice side during that referendum. So yeah, I could see it. Again, by the way, I fully want Arthur to be right. Like, I, I fully want you to be right about this because, like, I love Laura Kelly. I think she's an amazing governor. Derek Schmidt's going to be, like, almost as bad as Brownback. So I would love for you to be right. Um, But unfortunately, I'm like, the partisanship of Kansas and the fact that, like, we're not in, a, in another D plus. And, like, D plus the environment, I think she's, like, has a, you know, is, is has a 50% chance of winning. But anything below that, I'm just really concerned about her. But again, I would love to be wrong about Kansas. I want, I actively want people to dunk on me for my Kansas takes if I'm wrong. So please do dunk on me if I'm wrong, because I will be thoroughly enjoying getting laughed at for being a Republican wish caster in the state of Kansas. Um, so yeah, do you have any? Because I know this was a, this is a, you know, Halder race. Do you have any closing thoughts on Kelly? Not other than I, I think that that she wins and and she'll continue to be a very well liked governor of a of a red state. Similar, I think. I do think that actually, and I probably shouldn't be comparing because it's it's two very different scenarios, but I think that if, if Laura Kelly wins, it, it does give hope. I've been particularly gloomish on the prospects of Andy Bashir in 2023, but I think if she wins, it, it does give uh, an indication that, that Trump voters will vote for, for Democrats at uh, the governor level if they're doing a good job, which Laura Kelly is doing, and I believe Andy Bashir is doing as well. Um, that's probably, so yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my take. That's probably true. Uh, my only hope for Kelly is that if she does win, she doesn't ruin her reputation or not or ruin her electoral beastliness by running for Senate in 2026 and losing. Like, unless it's a blue wave, then maybe she can run. But I want to see 2024 first. But like, it'll be, I don't want her to get Steve Bullock and like have like a really good record as governor and then run for Senate and get smoked. So that's what I hope doesn't happen. Um, now, speaking of things I hope, well, I'm, I'm, my transitions have 
so cheesy today. But speaking of things I don't hope happen, uh, Arizona, I think uh, pain. Like I literally get physical pain from saying this, but I'm. I think Kerry Lake's gonna win. Do you? Agreed. Yeah, unfortunately, <clears throat> I, I think that this will be one of the states where we see a split ticket. Uh, I think Kelly will win fairly. Com- I say fairly comfortably. I think maybe by three or four, but uh, around the twenty twenty margin. And I think Lake will just pip it. Um, and I think that it, it will be disappointing as well with the way that Arizona counts. I think that it will be one where Hobbs will have the initial lead and, and it will get closed and I think Curry Lake we had just eke it out in the end which is uh not great. So it'll be uh, a heartbreaker speaking, is what you're saying. Yeah, I am. Uh, and speaking of somebody that, that does lean left, it's a race that I I think that we've really um I wouldn't say that actually I, I'm not as critical as Hobbs's campaign as, as some out there. I do think that the debate um debacle I suppose was, was foolish, but I don't think it's as campaign ending as, as some people are attributing it to be but I, I just think that on the whole um the polling and and just I think I think Curry Lake's running a much better campaign that, than many had expected I think that will ultimately reflect in the result uh, in the final results I think I, I hope I'm wrong but I don't think I will be yeah I Arizona is like kind of the reverse Pennsylvania where the Republicans ran a crazy person. And the thing is, unlike in Pennsylvania, it's actually working out for them. And unlike, like, you know, Shapiro and Hobbs are both are both kind of similar in that they're state, you know, they're row office statewide officials. And yes, Shapiro is still a better performer than Hobbs. I think we knew prior to any of this starting, I had Shapiro as like an A tier candidate and Hobbs as like a B tier candidate. But the thing is, Shapiro seems that, you know, be capable of actually running good statewide campaigns. And yes, Katie Hobbs' campaign isn't over, but like, Man, is it not looking good, and man, has she missed so many opportunities here. I'm really concerned about how she's going to do with the, you know, the McSally Biden voters. Because by the way, like the way that Kelly's been hammering Masters statewide, I do think that there's going to be um, a good chunk of mix of McSally 2020 to Kelly 2022 voters, especially with this Dobbs decision right in the rearview mirror. Um, but. I'm really concerned about Hobbs, how Hobbs is going to do in Maricopa. I think she'll win it, but I think it won't be by enough. I think she's going to do especially badly with Hispanic voters, especially because should she lost a county in the, you know, in her primary, she lost that, that small, uh, I think it's Santa Cruz County. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, Santa the Cruz. County, yeah. Yeah, she lost it to uh, Marco Lopez, who, yes, was, was the mayor of a town in that county. It's a smaller town. doesn't really mean a ton. She wants to, she wants to want to stay wide, but she actually lost that county by a fair bit. It wasn't even like a 50, 50 decision. She lost it by a fair bit. And, you know, it's, 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 it's never good to extrapolate from primary data to a general election. It's generally will lead you in the wrong direction, but like she has, she, she's been pulling significantly behind Kelly with Hispanic voters. Lake has like actually done a Hispanic, Hispanic turnout operation, which masters has not done. And Lake just seems like smarter than I think we gave her credit for. Obviously, I think her policies are pr- not not particularly smart, but you know, she was a TV anchor. You know, she knows how to be charismatic. She knows how to appeal to people. I think she's using those skills fairly well, and I think she's going to win by about two or three percent when it's all said and done. Yeah, I think slightly less. I think about one, but yeah, I'm kind of echoing what you're saying here. Um, yeah, Lake, I think, is actually a very strong communicator, um, which will probably boost her national profile to VP rumours and whatnot. But yeah, I think that I agree. Ho- Hobbs will have a particularly rough time in the among the Latino voters in counties like Yuma, Pima, um, obviously the Hispanic parts of Maricopa, despite me thinking that she will overrun in, in some of those suburbs or overperform. Um, but yeah, I, I think yeah maybe she loses one by one, which is why I think that she'll initially lead and it'll get closed and and it will be a heartbreak for Dems. But Tiltar maybe moves. I I think it, this is one that could move either way. But yeah, at the moment keeping it at lean uh, at tilt. Sorry. The only thing giving me like any bit of Hobbs hope, yeah, at this point is that like so. This is going to sound like a major cope. And by the way, it, it, it could be a cope because I'm definitely going to be coping very hard about this race after the polls close and after Dave Wasserman t- tweets that Katie Hobbs is running two and a half points behind Biden. 
Um, but like, oh god, I'm so not ready for that, man. I'm I'm so not ready for Arizona. Um, but like, okay, I think both of us agree that Arizona or that Hobbs skipping the debate is a bad thing to do in a toss up race like Arizona. Um, she did that. I think because she she thinks she's ahead or she thought she was ahead at least a month ago. I, for the record, I I, I still think she thinks she's ahead because if if she wasn't, she'd be asking to debate. Um, but like, she thinks she's gonna win. Okay, I think Lake thinks the Lake is also gonna win. But like, Hobbs thinks she's gonna win. I don't know all of her internals, but like, she like the Arizona Dems are still pretty confident in obviously Kelly and Hobbs and uh, Stanton and whatnot. Um, but like. Hobbs thinks she's ahead, and that is like giving me a bit of pause on you know being super bullish on Lake or you know kind of fully dooming on her. Like I'm dooming on Laura Kelly, but like, yeah, um, still not, still I think politically a misstep. Still I think a bit of a blunder, and I still think she's getting too cocky. And I, you know, in all honesty, I think Katie Hobbs has just kind of been doing this for like a few months now, where she's you know kind of been taking it for granted almost. Like maybe it's a bit of a stretch. Like maybe I'm being too unfair to her, but like she didn't even engage with Lopez during the primary. And yes, that might have been smart, but like she didn't really do any sort of operation in the primary because she thought she was a, a lock and she ended up underperforming her primary polls. And so like, I just don't know if she was really fully equipped to run this campaign or act. I just think that maybe like either, either the consensus is horribly wrong or she's going to end up being burnt on election day. Yeah, I, I agree. And always being cocky in a state uh, as close as Arizona is always a wrong move. I mean, look at obviously, I, I it's it's one that's sort of a beaten horse at this point. But Hillary in Wisconsin, um, I do get sort of vibes from that in which Hobbs does think she's ahead, and I think that Lake again, I agree. I think she's at she she thinks that she's ahead, but there's only one candidate that I'm seeing that, that's sort of making the the moves that you would do in a campaign in terms of the ground and in the media and, and that's lake and that's unfortunately why i think that she does win yeah that's ultimately most like if i could pick a competitive governor's race that i would want us to you know want to go blue would be arizona but yeah i'm not ready for the carry lake winning this race meltdown it's 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 not gonna be fun for me so um, now nevada nevada i'm like i was a big nevada Democrat optimist even a month ago. But this barrage of polling has been like really concerning for Steve Sisolak. Um, he's down by I think 0.6% right now, although we are getting more polls soon. Uh this podcast will be coming on Thursday. I think we'll be getting polls uh on that day. And uh obviously we'll be recording this the, the day before, but like yeah, I I still think that it's going to be pretty bad for Sisolak. Lombardo's a good candidate. He's going to do fairly well in Clark County. And I think Sisolak is going to, like, I think Democrats will do better with Hispanics than people think in Nevada specifically. But I think Sisolak's going to have a hard time winning back a lot of the, you know, pro Lombardo Biden voters in the Clark County suburbs, especially because Lombardo, like, Lombardo's been, like, one of the few Republicans that's actually been able to, like, talk with abortion in a way that doesn't really alienate either side. And I think that's really good for him because he's running, you know, a better campaign. And so ultimately, I think Lombardo's going to win by, I don't know, maybe a point. Uh, I just think Sislak just not the best incumbent, and I'm a little concerned about him at this point, even though I still think he's a better chance than a lot of people. Like, he's not Lenar yet, for the record. I still think he loses by a point, though. Yeah, I, I agree with basically every word of that. I think Nevada will be a state where um, there will be, especially in the row offices, some tickets that are split and some races that go either way and i think that the governor race would go to republicans i think lombardo's a a very solid candidate i think that he's running a a moderate campaign he's um focusing on or his his positions on social issues are i think sort of not turning off suburban voters that would otherwise go to sisolak um yeah i think maybe about a point and then again i think that lombardo could be one of those that that grows in popularity with a with a dem legislature that kind of holds him fairly powerless and he ends up in more of a, a sort of ceremonial position in a in, in a sense i suppose but yeah i think sisolak's really not had the best run of things i think his covid handling was poor um his approval ratings really aren't that good his fundraising i think is 
solid, but again, for compared to Lombardo, I don't think it's completely overwhelming. Um, and again, for from the not putting much stock into focus groups and anecdotes was sort of evidence like that, but from what I know is that Dems seem to be a lot more motivated to vote for their federal candidates than their state candidates, and I think that that, that sort of punishes people like this a lot. So yeah, I think a point loss is about right. Do you think he wins Washoe? No, I think he narrowly loses it. Really? I have him winning yeah. it by a point and a half. But what makes you think he loses it? Again, I think it's the the type of um, Biden moderate voters that are really just not going to be turned off by um, his social positions because they're fairly moderate and will be attracted by him on um, on other issues and again Sisolak's poor handling of COVID and, and other economic factors. Uh, I I think so. I have two reasons. I think it Sisolak holds on to it. One is that it voted two percent. I think a little over two percent to the left of the state, and I think Sisolak wins by more than uh, or loses by uh, like less than two. And also, it's trending left, so you can chuck on an extra point if you will. And finally, having you and uh having you and or you Nevada Reno is probably gonna net him a couple thousand votes, but it'll still be close. I, I think it's still a toss up county, but I'm pretty I'm way more because I like I think he'll do okay in uh Washoe. I'm way more worried about how he's gonna do in those Clark suburbs that like were not exactly promising in twenty twenty. So I have hope for Sisolak. I still think he has a chance to pull it out because he's still an incumbent without terrible approvals, but like yeah, not looking too good for Sisolak right now. Um, okay, so final state we're doing is here is, is Oregon. So Oregon, I'm just totally perplexed, and I really don't know what to expect here. I would not be stunned if Grayson wins. I wouldn't be stunned if Kodak does end up pulling it out here. But, like, Betsy Johnson is just making things so much harder because, like, you, like you can actually make two cases. The first case you can make is that She's hurting Kodak, which is, by the way, the case that I'm more subscribing to as of right now, because she's from the Portland suburbs. She was a Democrat prior to switching to independent last year. And she is just a very, very, um, you know, not household name, but like she has a base, right? Like she's not a third party candidate. No one knows who just is going to get 3% of the vote. Like she has a base. I think she cracks 10% of the vote. I think she'll get closer to 13 or 14 or 15% when it's all said and done. And so... I think most of those votes me coming from otherwise Kotec leading voters in the suburbs of Portland. And, you know, throw in the fact that like you have an unpopular Democratic administration hurting Kodak and, you know, Drayson running a really good campaign for like it's it's kind of like, you know, the best comparison, which we talked about earlier, was is the 2018 Kansas gubernatorial race, where you had a third party likely siphoning away more votes from that, you know, candidate in a very unpopular government in power that is likely to be, you know, repeated by the repudiated by the voters it's a state where like it's not as nationalized right like even in 2018 Kate Brown only beat New Bueller by seven and it was a D plus nine year and in 2014 Sam Brownback only beat uh, I think Paul Davis by about two percent in that in, in in 2014 even though it was a massive red wave so very similar states I think at the gubernatorial level they tend to always be close no matter what the national partisanship is, is. and we've also seen some concerning district level polling for Andrea Salinas and Jamie McLeod Skinner, not saying either of them lose. I think they're both favored to win right now. But yeah, very concerned about Tina Kotek and the fact that, we, that she's been in like a toss in a competitive race for over two months, two to three months in the race. Democrats still haven't nationalized it. Very, very concerning for us. So I think as of right now, my hot take for the podcast is that Drazen would win. Going to be close. It's going to really come down to how many votes Betsy Johnson gets. But that's the theory I subscribe to. Theory two is that uh johnson you know i've only seen people make this case so it's like the the it's, it's a it's an outnumbered minority seriously but case two is that drazen or is that johnson takes away an equal amount of votes because yeah she's a democrat but she's run you know been running a more right wing or a more conservative campaign especially issues like guns i don't really believe that i think it's at this point a bit a little far-fetched when you look at just the polls and what they're showing so as of right now i think tiltar yeah i think um we, you said it was a hot take, but I'll share your uh, hot take because I, I agree with it. I think at the moment, Christine Drizzen will win by probably about a point. But again, this is a race where a lot could change. Polls in Oregon can be a bit funky. Um, 
again, we, with independent candidates like Betsy Johnson, there's a 10 for them to to trail off in polling towards the, the final weeks. Particularly, I think this may happen if the race gets nationalised, and I think that would be to the benefit of Kotek. Maybe if that happens, I'd give Kotek the advantage. But I think as of now, which is what we're predicting, Drizan is leading the polls. Kotek doesn't seem to be running a good campaign at all, clinging to a unpopular administration, which is not something that I think is a, a good move on her part. And Johnson's not in being collapsing yet. She's still holding her vote, which I think I, I think is yeah, again, primarily coming from Kotek, leaning suburban moderates or suburban moderates that would otherwise go to Kotek. So I think at the moment, um yeah, I'd probably give Christine Drezan the advantage, but th this is one where I think is a lot more elastic in, in the possibilities than the other five. Yeah, like you said, there's just a lot of volatility here. And also, like, I don't want to have any, like, definitive organ takes to, like, literally election day because as, like, and this is a really good point you made that I forgot to bring up, but, like, third-party candidates tend to collapse down the stretch as, you know, their voters tend to, you know, break towards the party they're more ideologically similar to, right? So if that happens, it'll probably be to the benefit of Kotek. And so if Johnson even dips three or four points in the polls, I think you can make a case for moving it back to tilt or even lean B. So, yeah, I think for now, if the election were held today or tomorrow, I think Drazen would win. But, like, I have no definitive takes because, like, we, we have so much, you know, in, in, in this race specifically, I think we have a good amount of time left. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that this is, of, of all of the six, as I just said, this is one where a lot could change. I think that the, the spectrum of results is, is way wider than a state like Arizona or Nevada, where it can be, you know, I think that where the range is maybe only three or four points, I think this is maybe double that in sort of the range of where we could end up. Yeah, yeah that's that's probably accurate. I was going to try to think of another one, but I think you I think you hit the nail right on the head there. Um, so my, so to travel this podcast, obviously I'll, 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 geez, I can't talk today. I will redo our ratings here. Pennsylvania, you've got it as likely D. I've, I've got it as lean D. Wisconsin. I think you have it as tilt R. I have it as lean R. Um, Kansas, you have as tilt D. That was our biggest disagreement. I have it as lean R and I, for the record, just to put it out there, I think it's closer to likely R than it is to toss up, um, which I know is a really bad take right now, but I think she's going to lose, um, by the way, I, I by the way, I fully want to jinx it. Like I did this when Sununu when I thought Sununu was going to run, I like dug into that take and just it was like Sununu is going to run. Stop denying it. And then when he didn't run, I, I like people bonked at me, but I was like, you know what? I don't care because he's not running. That just saved us a Senate seat. So if Kelly wins, don't even like you know, no one on Twitter will. Uh, I, I will not be mad just to put it out there. But yeah, likely are or basically likely are Kelly's going to lose. Um, Arizona, uh, you have it as tilt or lean, Nar. I have it as tilt. Yeah, I have it as lean. Nevada, we both have it as tilt R, and Oregon, we share the hot take, as you said, tilt R. So, yeah, those are our six gubernatorial election ratings. And so if, I, if I'm doing math correctly, or unless you have any funky predictions that I did not touch on, uh, I have a 20 to 30 math in favor of the GOP. You have a 21 to 29 math in favor of the GOP. Is that right? Uh, I've not run the numbers, but yeah, I think that's sounds about accurate i think we agree on everything else yeah and so then the tipping point i guess for the 25 mark for democrats i would say because i'm at 20 i'd say 21 is probably oregon 22 is nevada 23 is arizona 24 is wisconsin 25 is kansas and then i guess the 26th state would be it's hard to get at that point but i think it would be maybe georgia or i, I don't know i'm even forgetting but i think to get 26 is gonna be pretty tough for the democrats here because i think you need georgia or maybe go down the, the, the U route of Oklahoma or South Dakota. But yeah, so uh, what are your tipping for? What are the four states you think go after the 21? Yeah, I would say Oregon 22. I'd say Arizona actually maybe 23, just because I think that maybe the range of possibility there is, is better for Hobbs and Sisolak, then Nevada, and then Wisconsin as a 25th. 26 could really be anything we you know, we, we, we've suddenly seen a, a few races got, come on online, as it were. Um, I think in terms of margin, maybe, yeah, Oklahoma, which I'm probably going to get slated for, but hard to take, I suppose. 
and then after that rest of the races i don't see races like texas or florida actually really being that competitive i think you probably agree yeah i don't i have no yeah i have no idea why i mean i do think texas will actually be a little closer than florida but i don't really understand the people who think those races are competitive at this point in time so uh, i want to say thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it again this is our third podcast we've done i'm always you know uh it's always good to have you on because i think uh i i enjoy the takes i enjoy the commentary and so thank you so much for coming on i, I hope uh, you had a good time i hope those listening had a good time enjoying uh me and arthur disagree about kansas and you know uh jokingly beef over oklahoma and south dakota so again you can go follow arthur on twitter at garden arthur thank um, you so much to arthur for coming on thank you so much to everyone who listened arthur uh I'll let you I'll let you do the outro because this is our final podcast for your midterms. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Brian, so much for having me on. And I hope all enjoyed me probably making a complete fool out of myself. But uh, yeah, we're only less than a month, 28 days, 29. I don't know when this will actually be going out. But yeah, um, this will probably be the final podcast before that I'm on before the uh, midterms. So yes, see you all out the other side. Thank you so much. Have a good one.